Good evening, and welcome to the Marian Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Sabrina Hartono, and I am one of your three Athenaeum Fellows for this year. We've all taken, or more likely, most likely will take, Econ 50, 101, and or 102 at some point during our time at CMC. The level of understanding we achieve in those classes about monetary, fiscal, expansionary, or contractionary policies is rather foundational compared to the real life mechanisms at play. One such real life case study, that of the United States today, is unfolding in real time. While the US is setting records for the longest economic expansion since World War II, coupled with extremely low unemploy uh, unemployment rates, there are troubling signs including, growth including in the growth rates, house housing market, wages, and et cetera. Compounding these trends is the interconnectedness of the global economy. Our speaker tonight, an academic with expertise in macroeconomics, monetary economics, and international economics, will share his perspective and insights to this paradoxical state of the economy. Professor John Taylor is the Mary and Robert Raymond Professor of Economics at Stanford University and the George Schultz Senior Fellow in Economics at the Hoover Institution. Before that, he taught at Columbia, Yale, and Princeton. He is known for his research on the foundations of modern monetary theory and policy, which have been applied by central banks and financial market analysts around the world. Professor Taylor has an active interest in public policy and has served in multiple advising capacities at both the state federal and international levels, including as Under Secretary of Treasury for International Affairs for President George W. Bush, where he was responsible for currency markets, trade and financial services, foreign, foreign investments, international debt and development, and oversight of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. In conversation with Professor Taylor will be CMC's Professor Manfred Kyle. Professor Kyle joined Claremont McKenna College in 1995 and teaches statistics, econometrics, and macroeconomics. He is also the associate director of the Lowe Institute of Political Economy and the chief economist for the Inland Empire Economic Partnership. He specializes in economic forecasting for geographical areas. Please silence and put away your mobile devices at this time and adjust your seats if you had not already done so. I must also remind you that audio and visual recording is strictly prohibited. Now, please join me in welcoming Professor John Taylor and Professor Manfred Kyle to the Athenaeum. So we'll have a bit of uh, water and then uh, start. Okay. <laughs> Would you like some? Thank you. I'm not even putting it sideways. <laughs> so John has been here twice before, uh, giving talks um, on both occasions. And we thought this time to change the format a little. Uh, instead of a uh, straight um, talk from Professor Taylor about a topic such as productivity and so forth, and to turn this into sort of a question and answer. And so I've picked some um, questions, either given to me from colleagues or from students, and um, then we'll have enough time for you to ask questions uh, in addition. And I thought, to start with, um, I thought there are a few people who um, have a, a road name after uh, them. I, I found that out in London, walking in some neighborhood, obviously a while ago when I still had more hair. Um, but uh, that was it. But uh, I thought one road named after you was good, right? Here I am <laughs> in Seattle. And it's not just one, it's two. Right, so I, I, I was threatening when we talked on the phone last night that I would uh, frame it and give it to him here, but it uh, <laughs> couldn't be done on such a short notice, but there you go. Uh, there you go. Anyways, this is today's um, LA Times, and it's the business section, and clearly sort of there's some 
uh, thought in the air of uh, a recession coming on. And let me tell you why this is of interest uh, in general to students. Um, the students who were worst affected by the recession, the Great Recession, which lasted from January 2008 until July 2009, were actually not the ones who graduated in 2009. They, you couldn't find a job. It, you knew it, right? The ones who were worse off were the ones who um, graduated in 2008. Because if you graduate in 2008, when are you interviewed? And you interviewed in 2007, in the fall. And in the fall of 2007, anyone would get a job. The economy was booming and everything was fine. Now you fast forward into May and uh, you graduate and uh, you start working for a firm and everything looks good. And then comes September, fi uh, September 15th, which if you ever have a job interview, I, I dare you to ask someone with an investment bank, what did you do on September 16th? So that was the downfall of Lehman Brothers. And everyone lost their job, right? And you can track that cohort, and they've never covered, recovered in terms of lost income, right? They, they fell to a lower level, later on found a job, but took them a long time. That was the Great Recession. So one of the things I want to discuss with um, Professor Taylor tonight is uh, there was a Wall Street Journal survey uh, of professional economists. So these are the folks at Barclays, at JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs. And 60% of the economists said, uh, these professional economists said that there would be a recession in 2020. 80% said by 2021, which doesn't bode well for uh, um, you graduating. Um, what do you think about these uh, forecasts of gloom and doom? I think they're wrong. They don't take account of policy. They're sort of like unconditional. It doesn't depend on the policy, but I think it depends tremendously. If policy goes off track and uh, doesn't continue to deliver strong growth, it will have a recession. That's how it's happened every time. The recession that you're talking about, which is, was devastating, I mean, to many people, not just college people, is disaster. And that was caused by policy. Those who forecast it, uh, maybe they knew about the policy, maybe they didn't. The, the Fed brought that on to, the, to a large extent, not entirely. They kept rates very low and, and encouraged search for yield and excesses in the financial sector. Uh, housing prices went flying through the roof. Uh, there was uh, too much risk taking and eventually that collapsed in two th late 2007, 2008, as you say. So that, I think, is based on a, on a poor policy. And if we have a similar poor, poor policy going forward, I think we'll have a recession. But I don't see that right now. I mean, uh, what do you forecast about the policy? Is it, what, what policy is underlying those forecasts? If it's a, a terrible fiscal policy, if it's a terrible monetary policy, regulatory policy, then I think we will have a, not only a recession or a slowdown, for sure, yeah. It should also could happen because of a shock. Well, sometimes recessions are caused by shock, but more often they're caused by policy mistakes. The most common shock is a policy mistake. You go back in the history of the U.S., the Great Recession, uh, uh, Great Depression was a policy mistake. The uh, period of the late 70s, early 80s was a policy mistake. So often it's policy mistakes. I spent so much of my research trying to find how to make the mistakes smaller. And, uh, and when we do, the, the recessions are less frequent. The, much of the period of the 80s and 90s until the terrible crisis you're mentioning was sometimes called the long boom, the great moderation. It was steady growth. I gave a talk here in uh, 1998 asking why we have this long expansion. Is it policy or is it luck? I argued it was policy. The policy changed and we had this mess. So I think you really have to think about the policy and it's not the only thing. There can be shocks, but frequently the shocks are policy. 
So I've projected uh, GDP growth rates since uh, the end of uh, World War II, and this is what uh, Professor Taylor is talking about, right? If you look at the expansions, so the gray shaded areas are um, recessions, and if you look at the recessions after 1981, recessions seem to happen less often than before, and that is what he calls the great moderation. That's what that um, time was, was referred to. Um, the only problem with that is that in 2007, in the fall, I had a colleague here who was teaching macroeconomics, and uh, he taught three sections, and in each one he walked in and he said, I feel like a general uh, talking about uh, old battles. We've conquered the business cycle. So by 2007, in the fall, um, we were pretty confident that we had done good policies. I mean, I know you weren't because you, I'll project the Taylor rule in a minute, um, you didn't think they followed the policies that were appropriate. But in terms of the history, uh, since 81, we had, what, the 90 recession, the dot com, and that was it, in a span of, of time that was very long. Yes, so th that, that is true, but I, I do think you can, and I have looked at the policy during that period, and it was, it was generally good. It wasn't perfect, but it was generally good. And so we had a long expansion. And uh, I wrote about that, talked about it out here. And I think the, the reason is the policy. It's not the only thing, but it's important. Also, there was a period in the late 60s where people wrote a book, Is the Business Cycle Obsolete? Remember, the Bronfman better. Is the Business Cycle Obsolete? It was crazy, but that's, some people think that way. I mean, this was, I've projected here, um, expansions in the United States since 1856. And you can see that, uh, as, as the ass fellow just told you, that we just, in July, set a record for the longest expansion, right? But the 60s are there. Um, it's uh, the, the other spike here. And then, of course, there was a spike in the 90s, right? But it took us um, until now to break that. So you don't think um, that humans and, uh, and, and expansions die of old age, do you? No, I don't think they die of old age. It could go longer. I mean, there are, th you know, sometimes w people get complacent. And it, I think this happened in the, in the period of the end of the 90s and the 2000s. Uh, policymakers get complacent. They say, well, we've had this long expansion. It doesn't matter what we do. We can have more regulations. We can have a crazy fiscal policy. It doesn't matter because they're there. They get complacent, so they don't worry about it. Frequently, that's what happens. And the policy, I think, is not as good as it otherwise be because, because people can't figure out why is it good. They don't think it's policy. And, and that's, to some extent, the case now. So there's a uh, woman in Japan who's 116 years old. Maybe that's sort of the equivalent of the current expansion. Um, and eventually she will die, but, but um, she will die uh, late in life because she probably didn't have the sort of food that some other people had with hamburgers and fries when she was young. That's probably the equivalent of the Federal Reserve feeding candy <laughs> through, uh, through uh, low interest rate policies. Uh, and that was what you were re referring to. So I put up something that um, Professor Taylor is uh, Famous for, he's famous for a variety of things, but this is called the uh, Taylor Rule. Um, maybe you can sort of uh, elaborate on, on that a little. Looks awfully complicated. <laughs> it's not that complicated. So the so-called Taylor Rule, which is uh, what people call it, I didn't call it that, uh, was put forth as a guideline uh, for central banks to use, came out of my research and it simply said that when the economy is booming, you should raise interest rates more than you otherwise would. When the economy is in a slump, you should lower interest rates. When inflation's picking up, you should raise interest rates. When inflation's falling, you should lower interest rates. Sounds pretty straightforward. There's a little uh, addition that says by how much, how much you should raise interest rates in all those four circumstances. But other than that, it's pretty much common sense. And uh, what, what has turned out to be the case, it's it's described periods when policy works well and when the Fed and other central banks have deviated, it's not worked so well. It's kind of a miracle in a way. Never expected it to work so well. 
I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of references to it, and I think every central banker knows about it. So it's, uh, it's an interesting thing for me. I didn't think it would be like that. I just wrote it down. I wrote a paper with one equation. It wasn't nearly that complicated, by the way. But that's, the, that's what it is. But you also felt that in the run-up to the Great Recession, that the Federal Reserve was not following that policy. Yes, they followed it uh, quite well, starting with Volcker, and Volcker got us back on track, and then through most of Greenspan's term, it was towards the end that they kept rates extra low. It was 1% when it should have been roughly 3%, so it was quite a difference. And that began mostly in 2003, 4, and 5, when you saw the run-up of housing prices and other things. So I think it's a direct uh, relationship. Um, there's a uh, history that helps you explain that. We had this terrible event that occurred. It's not rocket science, that's for sure. Um, I, Alan Greenspan is a good friend. I worked for him for many years in New York. He doesn't agree with me. He was running the Fed at the same time, so you might think he has other things in mind, but he generally doesn't agree. So it's, uh, and, and I think what's happened, it's interesting, at the time many people said, oh yeah, they have surveys like the one you just mentioned that said the Fed policy wasn't so good. But after time, people forget that and they go back to saying it was just fine, especially when you have the people in charge writing memoirs because they'll say it was just great, uh, whereas other people might not agree. Was it possible that around the turn of the millennium that there was such big fear of a deflation? I mean, there seemed to be deflation fear in the Fed that they kept the interest rates low because of that? Yes, that was, that was part of the reason. The, there was a, a conference uh, in 1999 where people started to talk about that. They had special devices that if the inflation rate got too low, they would do this and do that. But, but other people said different things. It's one of the interesting things about looking back in history. Different policymakers at the Fed said different things at the time. And I think that means there wasn't a specific thing so Alan Greenspan, uh, he was concerned about um, things like you just mentioned. Uh, it could be inflation could be too low. He didn't really put it that way, but the economy could be weaker. So he was worried about a downside risk and so kept rates low for that reason. That's what he said. Others would, would say, well, we don't need these rules. We could just, as long as inflation's low, we'll be okay. So there are quite a few different explanations uh, which were given, but that's why I think it's good to have a strategy or rule which you say what you're doing and you come as close to that as possible. So if you, there will be a, a meeting of the Federal Reserve at the end of October. Uh, if they followed the Taylor rule currently, would they lower interest rates again? No, they wouldn't. The most indicators, unless of course we have a recession or something, most indicators say it's still on the low side. Based on the experience of the 80s and 90s, uh, based on experience of other countries, um, it's not rocket science, so one of the things that, the reason there's a debate is some people think that the whole interest rate structure has declined. And some say it's because there's excess saving in the world, some say it's demography, the population is growing more slowly, so interest rates are going to be lower. So there is a lot of research, some from my former students, that say that it should be lower. But I don't agree with all that, uh, but there is, there is a debate, and I think for the most part now, the Fed, before it had these two recent re rate cuts, was pretty close to what, um, what, what policy rules would say. At least it was going in the right direction. As, as they were raising the interest rates. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so this is uh, an interesting thing. So roughly in 2017, Janet Yellen was the chair, uh, they started changing policy. They started raising rates, and they also did other things. They started publishing in their semi-annual report actual equations, not quite as complicated as the one is up here but equations, they were Taylor rules of sorts. And they started talking about them. Janet Yellen talked about it, and then Jay Powell became the chair, he talked about it. And so there was a real change. And uh, as, as part of that, they were gradually moving back towards a more normal uh, rate. And uh, that also caused actions around the world. The Europeans started to move their rate, at least talk about moving their rate. The Japanese started talking about their rate. And so you began to see a change uh, happening gradually. I was pretty positive about that. And there's other things, the central bank uh, people, the, the FOMC, Federal Market Committee people, uh, began to talk about it. So there was quite a change and the economy got better. The economy got better. It wasn't a coincidence in my view. 
There's other things that made the economy better, but that, you don't want to ignore that. So now you, the concern is you get off of that track, and that has implications not just for the U.S., but implications globally. We're in a global economy, and exchange rates are in people's minds, and a interest rate um, lower in the U.S. than otherwise will make the U.S. weaker, U.S. exchange rate weaker, not the economy weaker, make the exchange rate weaker, and people think that's good. And so if you look at the history of monetary policy during the period you're talking about, Manfred, you see that all over the place. So the Fed began a very accommodative policy in 2009, 10, 11. The Japanese say, hey, the yen's too strong, you're driving the dollar down. So Abe ran and appointed Kuroda, and Kuroda did quantitative easing, and he made the yen go down. And then Draghi, who's running the European Central Bank, says the same thing. He does quantitative easing in Europe, and the euro goes down. And so you see the same kind of thing playing out. So it is a global issue at this point. And I think um, people are beginning to recognize that, and there will be a change. I hope there is. Do you, do you think that there has been maybe a structural break of sorts after the So a structural break is when old relationships do not hold anymore as they did before. And so the question is, was the Great Recession a structural break? So for example, would the parameters uh, change, perhaps? I don't think that made the parameters change. That, uh, that event had uh, infected, affected people's lives greatly. I don't think it affected how the economy works. It affected policy, that's for sure. We had uh, many regulations put in place after that. There was uh, much more interventionist uh, economic policy following that, so it had impacts. But I don't think it changed the way the economy works. And I think that's important to recognize. The economy is, uh, has, has markets, has prices determined in the markets. It's global, there's capital flowing, there's firms starting up every minute, and that's how the economy works. And that hasn't really changed. So you can have the regulatory apparatus can change, there can be more emphasis on entrepreneurs, but the same, same fundamentals, I think, are there, and your policy should reflect that. So before I go into the economy today, I wanted to go back one more time to the Great Recession. So <clears throat> you sort of indicated uh, at various times that monetary policy was not at its best, perhaps, to, in, in the run-up to the recession. Um, but there was also the uh, problem once it happened that there were perhaps fiscal mistakes. Um, the first proposal that went to Congress asking for $700 billion was a three-page proposal um, which was rejected uh, in the House. And, and sometimes it helps to, when we, when we have these numbers like a billion, it's so hard for us to comprehend for what it is um, because they're so huge, right? So, so I thought about it once and I thought, what is a billion? And I went into a class and I said, if I put down a dollar note every second, one dollar note, how long does it take for it to be at a billion? <laughs> and of course, some smart ass student says a billion seconds. <laughs> that would be 31 years. That's how long it takes, right? So the uh, uh, package that Obama in the end had was 787 billion, something of that order. If you think about what that means, it means on the day when Jesus Christ was born, that every day you spend a million, you don't get to 787 billion. So it's huge, right? And so Congress at the time, the first one proposal was a three-page um, proposal which, which the House rejected. And um, the ranking Republic senator, um, Richard Shelby, said the crisis of 2000, criticizing Bernanke, and, and perhaps I'm putting you in, in, a, in a tricky position here, but I wanted to, to read this. The, the crisis of 2008 was days in the making. It took years, and in many of those years, Chairman Bernanke supported the actions that contributed to the ultimate scale of the problem we encountered, a scale we have not seen since the Great Depression. Um, I interviewed uh, Anna Schwartz at the time in New York, and I said, should Bernanke be reappointed? And she said, he should be punished. But that was Anna Schwartz. She was very tough. Um, wh wh do, you, do you think, I mean, does that speak towards the Fed having made that many mistakes in the run-up to the Great Recession? Well, yes, because I just argued the mistakes. Yeah. and they, uh, 
Also, the response to uh, the financial crisis, the Bear Stearns, uh, there's a bailout of Bear Stearns. We, we need to do that. We made schools better because we bailed out Bear Stearns or created. So there was a lot of misinformation passed around during 2008. And I think your example of the two and a half pages, not even three pages, proposal that they put forth uh, is an example. It wasn't really described very well, and, and uh, Bernanke and, and the uh, team went there to present it, and it was rejected. I think it's, I think it was, it was, by the way, it was passed later um, in a different form, and that was, well, it was clarified a lot better. I think it was, when it was clarified, it was a much better policy, but no, there is, there is uh, demonstrable mistakes that were made. And so Anna Schwartz is, by the way, a remarkable person. She, she wrote the best book about American economic history, at least the monetary side, with Milton Friedman. And it's, she's, she's a friend. She, the same time she's talking about Bernanke, she has a beautiful blurb on the back of a book I wrote uh, saying this is the greatest thing to read. So uh, I, I have to like her for that reason, but she, she was uh, terrific. Uh, friend and uh, she she spoke her mind. Let me say that she was speaking her oh, mind yeah. when you heard that. Um, <clears throat> moving on to to today's economy, I've done something very simple here. Um, I've I've fitted basically a regression line through the log of GDP as far as you're concerned output, and if you look at that line and then in the middle the gray line is the actual behavior of the U.S. economy. If you said from 1970 to 2006, you can explain the US economy in a very simple sentence. It grows by 3%, plus or minus 3%. And that's it. So, so if you need to explain to someone what you're learning at CMC in a macro course, there's much more. But the simple line is, it grows at 3%, plus or minus 3%. And that works until 2006, so by now, you think you maybe have a law of nature. And then in 2006, you fall below. And, and before, if you ever hit the lower upper bound, you sort of returned. But now you don't. Is that evidence of that you think there might be a structural break in the economy? Well, I've written quite a bit that this thing at the end is due to poor policy. And I've given a lot of evidence for that, written books about it, written many articles about it. And the policy did change. It was, uh, you mentioned some of the, the bailout policy was quite different. There were stimulus policies that were different. There were regulatory policies that were different. I don't know what your last data point is there, but there's 2017 and 2018 were a little better than the years before. So there is a change. And I have argued it's policy. And it's, uh, you might disagree, not everybody agrees. Some people say we're stuck, this is gonna just, the lower line is just where we are forever. Secular stagnation, that's the way it is. But I think there's so much evidence that a better policy can make us a better economy. And we've seen that in different parts of the world. We've seen it in the US. You can't see all your liberal wiggles on the left very well. But there were the, the, the 1970s were not such a great period in terms of growth. The, the, the Congressional Budget Office lowered our growth rates at that point, and then in the 80s and 90s, they were better, they raised it. Now, as you say, they're lowering it. So I think there's a tremendous amount of evidence that uh, a better set of policies will do a better job, and there's some things we're doing better now, some things that we're not. I think we should do more, in which case, there's no reason why we can't have 3% growth. Again, it's not out of the picture at all. So we should, try, we should try to achieve that. We should all work hard to have a faster growth rate. It would be better for Americans. Yeah. So when, <coughs> when Professor Taylor was here before, he talked about actually what the effect is of having growth go down by 1%, one, percent, uh, one percentage point probably is spoken. And if the economy grows at 3%, then per capita income, your command over goods grows by 2%. And at that growth, it takes you roughly 35 years, you double your command over goods. If it goes down to 1%, it takes you 70 years. So small changes in percentages have a huge effect, right? In case you wonder if he says 3% versus 2%, who cares, that sort of thing, right? So you have huge effects over, over yes, time. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay, let me try a different one for a change in, in regime. So the Federal Reserve in Minneapolis allows you to compare um, recessions. And you can put down, click at the bottom, uh, all recessions since 1948. 
And then the zero point is where the recession starts. And it looks at employment lost, right? So in this case, I've plotted just two, the two or, or two out of the three most severe post-World War II recessions. The red line is the current one, and the blue one is the Volcker recession, right? Paul Volcker um, had a re initiated a recession to get rid of inflation in 1981. And if you do this with all recessions, I didn't want to clutter the pictures, there is not a single recovery where it took 75 months to recover the jobs lost. By the way, if you ever wondered why people date recessions, that's why it's important. If you date them, it gives you a reference point, right? So you get a zero point, that's important. So you can compare recessions across, right? So why did it take 75 months for us to get back the jobs that we had lost? The blue line represented a very good change in policy. You mentioned Volcker coming in. He had a very high inflation rate. He had no choice in, to bring it down. He was appointed by Carter. He was reappointed by Reagan. It was devastating the economy. Uh, growth was slow in the 70s. He, uh, he took on the job and he got the inflation rate down. And that was a huge change. And the uh, other things that happened in the early 80s, you had a regulatory reform, you had tax reform. People were focusing back on the budget, it took a while. So I think the policy was much better. And I, you're, it's a beautiful picture, by the way, just don't forget this. And uh, it, so you had a more rapid recovery, mostly like a traditional recovery. And uh, you can see the differences in the policy. I think in this period, <clears throat> it was much different. We had uh, the stimulus packages, which you mentioned. They increased the deficit and didn't really stimulate. I've, I've written about that. And by, and by the way, it started at the end of the Bush administration. It wasn't really just in the Obama administration. And you have, if you looked at regulatory policy, it increased quite a bit during this period of time. You had tax increase during this period of time. So I think all those things add up to not such a good policy. And therefore, the, the, the uh, recovery wasn't so good. I would argue that if the uh, policy changed and you had tax reform, you had regulatory reform, that the growth could be stronger. It has picked up a bit, you know that. And so you can't quite see it in your picture. But it has picked up and hopefully we would continue with that and have stronger growth. I think it's very important to try to emphasize that this works, this kind of policy works. It works in other countries, it works in the US. And don't forget it, because otherwise we'll have terrible policies like this, like the red one. What would you suggest as a, a better policy at, at the moment? I would assume you would say tax rebates? Tax rebates? Less, no. less, less regulatory? So re rebates are where you just give money to people and it doesn't affect the tax rate, right? It's just a, and I think that was the, really the problem in these two stimulus packages that occurred in 2008, 2009. It was largely, it's partly was given money to the states. They basically pocketed the money. They didn't spend it. That was the Obama one. It was re rebates. That was the, the Bush one. It didn't really make much difference. You can't see much difference here in the picture. So to me, it's more tax reform. It's, it's having lower tax rates on a larger base. Lower tax, that's the nature of reform. Because the higher tax rates are disincentives to invest, disincentives to work, disincentives to hire people. And you have a, if you want extra low rates, you have a larger base. There's fewer deductions. So that's a very important part of tax reform. We got a little bit of that in, in uh, December 2017, but we could have more. And then the regulatory side is a, you have a, I think it's very important to have a regulatory system where you consider the costs as well as the benefits. Regulations have benefits, that's for sure, but they also have costs. And if you have people that don't care about the costs, they just talk about the, about the benefits, then you're going to get too much regulation, too much in the sense the costs are, are sur surpassing the benefits. And I think we've moved a little bit away from that with some of the appointees that have been made, um, the FCC, the, the, some of the antitrust people, some of the people at the Fed. So that's a, that's a positive change, but it might not continue. Plus, we don't have it all stuff. There's the deficit is still large. And as, as you know, there's still trade issues to be worked out. So if, if you <clears throat> would look at the Trump policies, and, and basically, as I understand it, Trump had three ideas in terms of economic policy. One was lower tax rates. The second one was less regulation. And the third one was infrastructure uh, investment. And he obviously 
only got two of those through, but you would say they were in the, in the right direction. Yes. Yeah. Um, still hacking away that uh, I think there's a structural change, and, and you don't. This is from The Economist um, last week, All which, this evidence. Um, which um, uh, sort of looks at something called the Phillips curve. So the Phillips curve is a relationship between inflation and the unemployment rate. And in the short run, at least there seems to be a trade-off. In the long run, there isn't. And the claim is that basically it has broken down, that given that we're now at 3.5% unemployment, we would expect a higher inflation rate, higher wages, higher inflation. Why, why do you think that has not happened? This is not a very good predictor. I agree, okay. because it should be the change in it. the inflation rate, okay. right? It's not a great if predictor. If nothing else. I think that in many respects, uh, Policymakers have paid too much attention to the Phillips curve. It's not very accurate, especially at these levels. Uh, it, it conveys a general tendency of the economy. But uh, I think there's, uh, there's lots of reasons why inflation is lower. Maybe this monetary policy is not as stimulus, it's as stimulating as people might think. Um, there's evidence that these extra low rates are not passed through to uh, the rest of the system, that the banks are not lending as much because of that, so it may be not so beneficial. It's certainly true of other countries. The European Central Bank has different rates for different people, so it's quite, quite remarkable. So I think there's um, reasons for this, but again, it's not a rocket science picture. And I think if, in, in many respects, the, the, the failure of macro policy in the old days was to pay too much attention to this. And there's, there's less attention paid to it now you can't ignore it. It's an equation out there, and it's, it, it, it's, it's a guideline, but it, you can't really f pay too much attention to it at, at a time like this. So what, so what would be your explanation why wages at this low level of um, uh, unemployment have not risen by well, more and, and prices? So wage growth depends on productivity, right? And of course. Productivity has to pick up. And we've seen a little bit of productivity picking up. It'll, if we see more, then we'll see more. Real, real wage growth. That's what I'm hoping will happen. We'll get higher productivity growth with the right policy. We'll get higher labor force growth with the right policy and higher wage growth with the right policy. That seems to me the key and we're getting just a little bit of that but not enough. And I think the other thing when you interpret these so-called Phillips curves is lots of other things in the economy is labor force participation rate, is employment to population ratios which make a difference as well. Uh, but this is this is one one thing to look at uh, along among among many the different things. <coughs> My last attempt. This is housing <laughs> starts. Um, Am I doing so? Okay? These are monthly housing starts at an annual level, <coughs> and um, the magic number to know historically is 1.5 million. So in the United States, at an annual rate, meaning the monthly rate multiplied by 12 you get, as an average, 1.5 million, right? After the Great Recession, housing starts obviously have gone through the basement, have gone south. And to this day, we don't have 1.5 million housing starts. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you accumulate the housing starts for the 10 years of the expansion, we're now at 9.7 million. The previous uh, expansion was only six years, and we had 11.2 uh, million, right? Uh, th this, I mean, this is a big puzzle, isn't it? Why housing has not recovered like you would uh, expect. By the way, I, I agree with you that I don't, I don't see a, a recession coming either, but my argument is that uh, the excesses which typically occur in automobiles and durables and in housing have not occurred. And, and that is why this time it's different. You can certainly see that when you're going into yes. the Great Recession. Yeah. yeah. So, so what do you think, I mean, a lot of people are, are stunned about the housing market. They, they, they just don't understand why has housing starts not picked up. But what is your thought on that? I think it's mainly the demographics in the economy. There's, there's regulatory issues, uh, the um, cost of starting a house in large parts Impact of California. Impact fees. Pardon? Impact fees. Yes, that sort of for thing. example, yeah. yeah, I think that. But I don't know, this is not, really not so bad. I mean, there's, the population's growing, people need new houses, but I think the real concern, if you had this boom and bust, you don't want to have the boom and bust again. As you say, that's a, a factor that reduces the risk of a, of a sharp downturn. 
So I think it's fine. So you're not concerned about no. this? No. Well, I mean, the, you want to look at, I mean, this is housing, there's automobiles, there's services, there's uh, iPhones, a million things that are out there that didn't even exist. So they're taking people's, uh, the growth is, growth is what you want to look at. Housing is part of it. And you'd like to have business investment too. Business of investment, yeah. yeah. So. Um, Great charts, by the way. <laughs> He's, the Federal Reserve produces them, so this is where our tax money goes, right? <coughs> Um, here's one that, that uh, we had to, to make ourselves. So, um, in the, it's, it looks a bit complicated, but it's not really. It looks at different sectors of the economy. Um, and what it does is it says if you start in 2007, in the summer, how many jobs in each sector were lost, right? So that's the bottom here. And then if you go up, if it's green, we have gained more jobs. If it's in the red, we have not recovered, right? So it's fairly simple. So by 2014, as you saw in the previous graph, um, the US economy had recovered all jobs. But that doesn't mean that they got the same jobs back as they had before, right? So the last recession was referred to as a man session because most of the jobs were lost in sectors that were dominated by males, namely manufacturing and construction. And to this day, those jobs have not come back, certainly not in construction. There may be other reasons in manufacturing, right? And the savior for the US was, were three sectors. One is health, education to a much lesser extent, leisure and hospitality. And with those two sectors, life would not look so good because you think of health perhaps as doctors, but health are also home care workers. Um, that sector never lost. Is, maybe it's Obamacare, I don't know. Um, and the third sector that really saved us in terms of GDP is professional and business services. The, hopefully the jobs you will get into, right? And those are high paying jobs. Um, whereas if you were a construction worker or manufacturing before and you lost your job and now you're working as a valet parking attendant or you sell t-shirts in Cabazon, uh, employment is back, but it's not back in the same way it did. So there was a lot of churning in the U.S. economy, right? Is that perhaps also a possibility in terms of why things are different? I think it's important to have a churning where people can buy what they want. It's a free market economy. If you want to buy fewer homes and more personal services, that's fine. I don't think the government should be driving the sectors one way or the other. I think this shows some important flexibility in, in the economy, and it changes in technology too. So I think it's fine. I mean, there, you, you, you worry if there's manufacturing is, is slumping because of uh, an unfair trade or because of uh, practices in manufacturing that are over-regulated in the manufacturing sector. If there's something wrong with policy that's driving it in that direction. But this, I think, the, the fact that you're moving from one sector to another isn't necessarily a bad. I think it's a good, healthy economy if you're changing from one sector to another and you're not restricting one versus another. I think it's fine. It it's, could a also, nice, it's a nice chart. It could also explain why it took a little longer for us to recover. Because I, if you well, change I, between I, I, sectors, if you were a construction worker, you're not going to become professional in business. Well, so someone's it. doing it. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, so no, I think the, the explanation for this slow recovery, which we had, at least until recently, you get from looking at the other uh, periods which are much faster growth. And there it's all different uh, patterns of sectoral development, but what you see the difference is in the policy. And so I look at the, the regulatory policy more generally, the policy with respect to taxes more generally. I don't think it's possible to, to distinguish, the, say, the 1980s rapid expansion from the post-2009 slow expansion based on these considerations, I look at other things instead, which I think are add up as a consistent explanation over many different periods of time in the US and many different countries. And we know it must have worked because GDP recovered by 2011, employment recovered by 2014. Right. So it wasn't that we replaced good jobs with bad jobs. Right. Um, one last one that I thought would be of interest, which is I plotted employment in manufacturing and output in manufacturing. 
And uh, that's misunderstood a lot of times, isn't it? It's, it's employment in manufacturing may have gone down because of uh, automation. Productivity. But, but certainly output hasn't until very recently, right? So this is, this is productivity you're seeing, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's good. And so I think it, it's sort of this overemphasis at the moment that manufacturing is on its way down. I don't think that's true, do you? I think, I think it's a good idea to focus on the output. Obviously, these uh, people who are losing their jobs want to make sure the economy is flexible. They have something else to do or there's a welfare system for them. But, this, uh, but you want to, st want to stop progress. Progress is more output per worker, higher productivity. And that's why we become wealthy. That's why the U.S. is wealthier than Senegal. It's all productivity. Exactly. Um, let me uh, throw this one up, uh, talking about productivity increases. So this is basically from a study from uh, Oxford, which is um, uh, Frey and Osborne, about the jobs that are in danger, right? And uh, not good these days to be in accounting, right? Um, if you look at that. Economists is a bit tricky, it's 43%. The advantage of Professor Taylor and myself is we also preach economics, so you gotta go down to clergy. <laughs> And if you look at clergy, there is very little chance of losing anything, right? So that's us. But um, uh, would, you, would you see these, these um, this is this sort of a question of automation and, and threatening of jobs from automation. Would you see that going? I'm more positive, I think, than uh, many people here that if you have the economies reasonably flexible, that the automation allows workers to produce more. And uh, that's certainly true of almost every area I, can, area I can think of. And so that makes the incomes of the workers higher. It makes uh, people better off. The danger, as you're alluding to, is people are going to lose their jobs. Uh, artificial intelligence, for example. The, um, a few months ago, I sat on a stage with a very um, well-known computer scientist. And uh, my, uh, my wife was sitting, well, on as my beautiful niece who's sitting in front of me, but my wife was sitting where Alana was sitting, and next to her was my daughter. My daughter's a radiologist, and the uh, computer scientist says, you'd be crazy to go to radiology these days. Those are jobs that are gonna be wiped out in a matter of no, no time. So I had to I interrupt him and say, well, there's other things that could be happening. Maybe the radiologists would be, be more productive and get more work or something like that. But I think there's this tendency to think about the way the jobs are destroyed. And there's less emphasis on the way the jobs are created. The unemployment rate is 3.7%, roughly speaking. So that's very low. In the, me in the meantime, we're getting tremendous amount of innovation in the economy. So if you can keep the economy moving, um, a reasonable amount of uh, growth in general, the, uh, the automation is a good thing. And we've seen history, you know, the U.S. used to have 50% of people working in agriculture, now maybe has three or four. That's, uh, the, but, but the uh, people have other kinds of jobs. It's, of course, generations, it takes time. And people will be hurt. Uh, people will lose their jobs. So you need to have the ability to get another job or there's a, a, a welfare system or a safety net that's provided for that. But uh, the, you wouldn't want to say you rule out inventions or ideas based on this chart, because it may go completely the other way. And uh, it's nice that economists are in the middle, but uh, I don't know, maybe because we have tenure. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I thought it was interesting, actually, when you said that about uh, your wife and, and that talk. Um, my mother, I remember, picked me up once from high school with a car when, when I wasn't allowed to drive yet. And we went to a gas station. And in Germany at that time, for the first time, they put in uh, sort of semi-automated uh, um, gasoline stations, right? Where you would uh, put in your five Deutsche Marks when we still had Deutsche Marks instead of the Euro. Um, and uh, at that time, there was still a parking attendant there and he would come and fill it up. And, and I never forget this, my mother uh, looks at him and says, how does it feel about losing the job tomorrow? I thought, mom, oh my God, what are you saying, right? But obviously, that person who worked in the gas station found a job elsewhere, right? Good. And that's, that's the point. 
Well, I um, wanted to ask Professor Taylor a bunch of more questions about not the economy, but actually Stanford University and their economics department and sort of how he has seen changes there um, or about his uh, sixth edition of the uh, intermediate and seventh edition of the principles book. But I think we are at a point where it would be better if we opened up the discussion to everyone because I'm sure that you have questions for him that um, uh, are more interesting than, than perhaps the ones that I can pose. We now have some time for questions. Please raise your hand and Lale and I will come to you with the microphone. When asking your question, please stand up and try to keep it brief. As always, priority will go to students. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. My name is Nathaniel. I enjoyed your talk. Uh, my question is, you briefly mentioned the rise of artificial intelligence, which is a sector that China appears to be definitively winning given their access to a big data regime. Um, understanding that national deficit has a large potential in our economy, my question is, can China successfully utilize their AI proficiency to transfer to the service sector? And if so, should we be concerned about China selling off US treasuries and endangering the US economy? Okay, so I think that artificial intelligence is being used in different ways in different countries. Uh, artificial intelligence is really being used to look at individuals and their faces in China. That seems a restriction on freedom or interference on freedom, which I'm not such a fan of. Uh, it's less of that in the U.S. There's uh, also uh, more emphasis on internet and those kinds of exchanges in the U.S. than in, in China. So. That seems to me the way that technology is being used, different ways. Your, your question, I think, is whether there's an advantage in terms of growth. But I think, it, again, it depends on how it's used. And if it's too much, this is an area where I think too much centralization can be really a disadvantage. You, the, the people who know the most about how to apply technology are the people on the ground, the people who know what they're doing. I just gave a talk in, in Austin to 50 CEOs of small firms, medium sized, that are growing very rapidly. Incredible! I don't see how you could possibly do that in any kind of a, a centralized system. New ideas, new applications. They're, they're ranging from skateboards to healthcare services, and it's just a beautiful thing to see. So I think that's you want to preserve that aspect of your economy. That there's entrepreneurs, there's new ideas. You don't squash them. You let them happen. And I think that system is better that for us. We have a better system right now. Now, not to say there's not huge entrepreneurship and people making a lot of money, a lot of billionaires in China, but you worry that it gets restricted. I worry that it gets restricted because it'd be better if more people are come out of poverty in China. Remember, I don't know if I said this before, but, but in the last uh, 30 years, the poverty rates have, have just plummeted in the world from 40% to 9%. And a lot of that is China because people coming out of poverty, it's not just China. So I, I don't want to squash any technology that does that. I just wanted a story about different parts of the world. I was just in Africa, and it was a conference in North Africa of econometricians, and uh, there was presentations from, from uh, young uh, academics and others from Senegal, from Mozambique or Rwanda, and they were doing the most sophisticated presentations I could, as if they were right here. And they're getting information from the internet, from Facebook, from Google, and it's just amazing what can happen but we don't want to squash it. We want to encourage it. And a lot of the artificial intelligence types of things are like that. Anyway, I get a little carried away. Be careful. And Dr. Taylor, thank you very much for your talk. My name is Ricardo, and my question pertains to the relationship between the executive branch and the Federal Reserve. So while the chairman of the Federal Reserve is appointed by the executive, the chairman has a mandate to take decisions independently from the executive. Um, and the current occupant of the White House seems to have a different understanding of this relationship. Do you think that there is any blame in the executive for the bad policy that you referred to during your talk? So the question has about, about monetary policy, its independence, and how that's standing up against many c complaints, accusations coming from the White House whether or not Trump's comments on Powell's decisions yeah. are leading to bad monetary policy. Okay, so it's a very good question. I, I know Jay Powell, he says no. Um, there's a question whether it works indirectly. 
Um, and many people, uh, of course, are very favorable about President Trump, and so they'll tend to say things that he says that's natural. And so it comes in maybe in different channels, so you don't know for sure. Um, and uh, I think that what's most important is that the, the, the Fed matches its independence with some more concrete descriptions of what it's doing. So independence is not independence to do anything. Independence is to do good monetary policy. If you describe what the policy is, I think of like a t Taylor rule, whatever it happens to be, then you have the accountability that goes along with the independence. So it's not just independence, it's accountability to do something and stick with it and explain why you're doing something differently. And that sort of goes hand in hand with the independence. So I want to see more of the second, and I think that will be better to preserve the system, which has worked pretty well. Same is true in other countries, by the way. The same thing is happening more broadly. It's not just the United States. And the same, the same cure, I think, would work quite well. Question in the back. Hello, Professor Taylor. Thanks again for your talk. Um, you talked a lot about how important policy is in economic growth today, and I was wondering if you could talk more about other factors of market growth, for example, maybe credit use or like productivity, and what role you see them playing in determining, when they, determining whether there will be a recession in 2020. It's a bit hard to understand. Yeah. Um, can, can you repeat it perhaps slowly and, and uh, speak sure. louder? Yes. So you talked today about um, the importance of policy, and I think that policy in particular is a little hard because policy can basically encompass everything. So I was wondering if you could talk more about other factors of market growth, for example, maybe credit use or what you talked about also productivity and what role you see them playing in determining whether there will be a recession in 2020. Why don't you, why don't you begin? She wants to know about inequalities uh, and poverty uh, in general. What would your thoughts were on that in terms oh, I, of policy? Yeah, so, uh, so the question is income distribution and what it should be. I, I am concerned about the income distribution. It's mainly concerns about equality of opportunity. Um, in California, I'm sorry to say, it has the poverty rate in America, highest poverty rate in America. When you take uh, cost of living into account highest poverty rate in, in, in the, of states in America, richest state. So that doesn't seem right to me. It's a huge amount of, of inequality in that sense. So I think there's reasons for public policy to deal with it. I tend to think of it, um, perhaps because I'm an educator, you make sure the education isn't slipping. It's, it is slipping, the US is way behind compared to other other countries are doing. We could do much better, mainly K-12 education. So that's an example of how to remedy it. If you look at the reasons for the, the uh, d spread in income distribution, a lot of it has to do with the technology and people not being trained enough to do with the new technology. So they don't have the education. So that's the things I would focus on. I think there's some thought that you just need higher tax rates. I don't think that's the answer. And uh, you have, you know, there are proposals to do that, but that has a disadvantage of slowing the economy down. One of the um, I don't think it's irrelevant that the slow growth that we've had recently has made it worse for certain people. So I put those all together and, uh, and I think the income distribution is an issue. It's, it's certainly an issue about in inequality of opportunity, which I'm afraid we have in this country. Yeah, thank you for your response. Um, that wasn't quite m my question, so let me repeat my question. Please let me know if you don't understand my question. Um, you talked a lot about policy, and I think it's a difficult answer because I think that policy can basically encompass everything if you want it to. And I was wondering if you could talk more about other factors of market growth that might be more exogenous from policy. For example, I'm thinking of like credit or productivity, which you also touched upon today. And I was wondering what you what role you think these other factors might play in determining whether there might be a recession in 2020? So just these are factors other than economics? No. Other, other than policy? Right. So yeah, well sure, there's lots of things. It could be that people just get discouraged and don't want to work hard. Uh, it could be a, a shock from abroad, a sort of a military uh, shock, it could be a, a drop of confidence, there's other things that can happen. 
I think those are not the things that have driven most of the ups and downs that Manfred has referred to. And uh, uh, national security is a very important issue. You can have some shocks related to that. Trade policy is another one, but I can't mention policy. But I think there's quite a few. I actually think that, I don't know if this is getting to your question, there's a, a, a relationship between economics and these other policies, which we tend to forget. When one of the times I served in government, um, I, I saw th there's three, there's diplomacy, there's military issues, and there's economic issues, all part of our foreign policy. We tend to forget the economics a lot, and I think we need, for example, we need to have allies that have strong economies. And we have to make sure that the, what, what we think is good economics is spreading. So I think that's part of our good foreign policy is of all three together. Frequently, we forget it. People in diplomacy or military strategy, they want to say who's up, who's down, which government is doing well, where frequently it's the economics that are underpinning that. So I think I'm driving the answer back towards economic policy more than you want. There are other issues, but it's, uh, I don't want to forget the economics, sorry. We have a question over here. Hey, thanks for the talk. So um, this is a question that pertains to the first part of the interview. And you talked a little bit about how the ups and downs of the economy is based on policy. So in hindsight, it's really easy to say whether policy is good or bad. Um, and this is kind of based on my limited knowledge. But I know that the policy of today isn't going to cause a recession tomorrow. The policy today will be realized for better or for worse in the distant future. So what I think is a critical time for the economy um, I was just curious what your opinion is about the current policy that is the policy that was implemented in the distant past, and if you could be uh, like specific about the policies that you're talking about. Thanks. So I think uh, current policy, as I indicated to Manfred, uh, the tax reform in December 2017 lowered the personal rates just a teeny bit. Of course, in California, it changed the uh, it broadened the base tremendously. Right, it lowered business taxes 35 to 21 at expensing of investment. It lowered small business taxes. Those are the things that, sh by basic economics, says the economy should go stronger. More investment, more growth. It's not, it's just straightforward economics. And I would say on the regulatory side, um, it, here it's mainly appointments. There's some laws that were changed uh, on financial firms that have to be larger to get the stress testing, for example. That's looking at cost benefit analysis. You've had some appointments of, of people, uh, the FCC, Ajit Pai, or Randy Quarles at the Fed, who are thinking about these things in a more cost-benefit analysis. So those are going in the right direction. I think trade is more uncertain. We don't know what's happening there. And I'd like to see these resolved towards more lowering of trade barriers. So, so far, we haven't seen, seen too much. We have the USMCA, which has not been passed yet. It would be great if that was passed. Uh, that would be something that would be pretty straightforward to do. Um, and, and so the, right now that's mixed. And the monetary policy we've talked about a little bit, I think it's basically been going in the right direction. It's a little squishy recently, but I think that's basically good. I think part of the reason why the economy has done a little better in 2017, 2018. And then there's the deficit, which is not good. We have a huge deficit. It's trillion dollars a year. Uh, in a relatively full employment economy, and I think we need to deal with that. So, so it's a mixture of goods and bads, and I emphasize in the goods, but I'd like to see these other things addressed as well. Uh, it's maybe harder, people don't seem to care about it. I did an um, op-ed um, recently with uh, some of my colleagues, George Schultz, Sean Kogan, in the Washington Post about the big deficit, and never been ridiculed so much in my life. What are you worried about the deficit? We have interest rates are low, foreigners are by our debt, all sorts of things I never heard before. And so that's out there, and I think maybe it, it's, more, it's a reason to be more um, focused, less complacent on that, on that last issue, which may be the one that, that hurts us ultimately. Internationally, is more difficult. There's security issues. I think the negative interest rates in so much of the world is a, is a risk that we're taking, and the quantitative easing still exists in many parts of the world. Does Uncle Sam start to look more like Uncle Dimitri? <laughs> With the deficits? Yeah, that's a good way to put it. 
Hi, I'm a big fan of your and your colleague at the Hoover's work. Um, in your talk, you mentioned a lot about regulation and taxes, but can you discuss the current monetary regime and potential of a liquidity trap and, again, a potential emergence of untraditional policy like MMT and its effects on the long term of the economy? I didn't get the last part of that. Um, can you repeat, um, put it into two parts? Yeah. Um, Basically, can you discuss with low interest rates and potential, even though you said it's most likely not going to happen, the potential emergence of a recession, um, how our low interest rates uh, relate to modern monetary theory and other untraditional monetary policies? I'm sorry. And, and specifically, you had asked before liquidity trap, uh, right? Hand in hand, both of them. Yeah. Yeah, so modern monetary theory, that's what you're asking about. Yeah, so that's a... That's an idea that we just increase the money supply and the economy will do better. And uh, I, I don't think that's true. I think we've gone through that. Uh, it's, it doesn't, simply put, it doesn't seem to work. It's basically money finance de deficits. I sometimes joke that modern monetary theory is like the Holy Roman Empire. It's neither modern nor monetary nor a theory. And uh, of course, I don't, not everybody laughs at that anymore. But it's, uh, it, it, we've worked on that a long time. I don't think that's the way to go. Fortunately, the Fed is not enthralled with that idea, at least the current Fed. So, uh, so that's what I think about that. I do think the, it needs to be, we need to get out of this uh, really low interest rate globally. And it's, it is a global thing. I think a lot of it has to do with exchange rates. And it's like an exchange rate competition. And I think it'd be healthier if we did that, healthier for the US economy and healthier for the global economy. We don't want to get to this global financial crisis going again. And that means getting interest rates to more normal levels. I mean, we have not had negative interest like this for thousands of years. So it's very different. And the rationale for it is not all that great. And we're now getting more research that's raising questions about it. And so I, I think we'll, we'll, ch we'll change before too long. We have another question over here. Uh, starting in, er, thank you for your talk, first of all. But starting in 2018, the Fed uh, began a policy of quantitati quantitative tightening, um, kind of a letting assets and their debts uh, expire. Uh, and recently, in 2000, 20, 2019, they began they discontinued that policy and began balance sheet expansion again. They didn't call they didn't call it quantitative easing, but it kind of seems that way. Is it concerning that the Fed is pursuing quantitative easing again, even though we're not in a crisis? Is it quantitative easing becoming a permanent policy of the Fed? And is that concerning when we get to a recession um, that they might not have more tools to deal with such events? Yeah, I think it would have been better had they continued on the strategy they were in through most of 2018. They changed and they, uh, they now flattened out the balance sheet and now they're expanding it again. It's a little different because it's just a short end of the curve, just short uh, short maturity security, so that's why they say it's not quantitative easing. But I think it does increase the size of the balance sheet. The, there's a difference now which is not completely uh, studied enough in my view, and that's what's happened in the money markets. And there were some, as you, as you know in the newspaper, some spikes in interest rates. I think they had to do with the different regulations that are in place now because the supply of reserves is so much greater than the demand. So there's some extra demand for reserves that's being generated. I think it's by regulations. So I'd like to see that explained and worked out. Now people don't know what it means. There's no quantitative easing. And that would be, it'd be better if that was clarified uh, at some point. And uh, more generally, uh, n normalizing policy means the central bank's balance sheets get back to something close to the demand. And then the interest rate is market determined. There is a very important difference between monetary policy now and where it was before 2008. Before 2008, if the Fed wanted to change the interest rate, it would change reserves, lower interest rate by higher reserves and vice versa. That's gone because reserves are so high. So instead, they set the interest on excess reserves. The mark, it's an administered rate. It's not a market rate anymore. And I think it would be better off it was if we went back to a market rate rather than an administered rate. They're not doing that right away um, because of these problems in the money market. This will be our final question for the evening. 
Hi, again, thank you for your talk. Um, I'd like to touch on an area of policy where there is more of a bit of tension between business and um, mainstream politics, and that's the environment. Um, there's obviously a lot of talk on both sides about like, you know, the classic economic theory, which is, you know, regulation overall like hurts the economy and slows growth. Um, but especially among young people and um, many of the like democratic candidates, they're making you know, regulation in terms of like the environment, a huge priority. And so um, from an, a purely economic perspective, you know, ideals aside, do you think there is realistically a way that um, like there can be like things put in place that do benefit or at least like minimize harm on the environment um, while continuing to like maximize growth and like have like a stable economy or, um, and if so, like, you know, how do you think that would happen? So uh, uh, there's no question there's, there are externalities. There's no question there's pollution. And, and there's reasons to try to have government policy reduce that. And there's different ways to do it. And some is taxes, some is direct controls. Uh, some is let the private sector work it out. Okay, there's different ways it can happen. But you don't wanna say they don't exist. The debates are how big they are, right? And, and also debates on how you deal with it. I, I tend to think a lot of it could be done by business-to-business uh, -business arguments. And I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The pollution was unbelievable. It wasn't the federal government was not related to that reduction. It was the local community that did it. So sometimes it works quite well that way. Not all the time, this is a global thing. But I think you've gotta be really cognizant. There are costs, measure them properly. And there are benefits, measure those properly, then come to the best solution. There are different, different views. You know there's huge polarization right now in the, in the United States about how to approach different things. And I, all I can say as an economist, let's, let's think about the similarities of views and try to get to some answers rather than just emphasize the differences. And I think you're pointing to an area which is really ripe for an improvement in the discussion. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have this evening. Please join me once again in thanking Professor Taylor and Professor Kyle. Thank you. Okay. Well done. Thank you so much.